Call the assembly to order. Unless there's objection, the list of speakers will be closed at the end of the next speech. Uh, and the next speaker on the list, that's to say there are other speakers on the list, but the next speaker, at the end of his speech, the list will be closed as the delegate of the Netherlands. And I now call upon him. Mr. President, honorable delegates, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which is before the General Assembly
precisamente el 11 de diciembre de 1946. Posteriormente, durante la sesión de 1947... Señor presidente, en 1946, durante la segunda parte de la primera sesión de la Asamblea General, las delegaciones de Cuba, India y Panamá presentaron una moción declarando que el genocidio es un crimen de derecho internacional, pidiendo a todos los Estados miembros su cooperación para prevenirlo y castigarlo, y encargando al Consejo Económico y Social la tarea de preparar un proyecto de convenio sobre la materia. La moción de Cuba, India y Panamá fue aprobada unánimemente el 11 de diciembre de 1946. Posteriormente, durante la sesión de 1947, una moción presentada ante la sesión plenaria por Cuba, Panamá y Egipto logró salvar del olvido la moción primitiva y el proyecto de convención. Desde 1946, dos años de labor intensa por un destacado grupo de juristas que estudiaron y redactaron la convención han conducido al proyecto que ahora tenemos delante. Ese proyecto, desde luego, no es una obra perfecta. El genocidio, como figura jurídica, la moción declarando que el genocidio es un crimen de derecho internacional, pidiendo a todos los Estados miembros su cooperación para prevenirlo y castigarlo, y encargando al Consejo Económico y Social la tarea de preparar un proyecto de convenio sobre la materia. La moción de Cuba, India y Panamá fue aprobada unánimemente el 11 de diciembre de 1946. Posteriormente, durante la sesión de 1947, una moción presentada ante la sesión plenaria por Cuba, Panamá y Egipto logró salvar del olvido la moción primitiva y el proyecto de convención. Desde 1946, dos años de labor intensa por un destacado grupo de juristas que estudiaron y redactaron la convención han conducido al proyecto que ahora tenemos delante. Ese proyecto, desde luego, no es una obra perfecta. El genocidio, como figura jurídica, es nueva y no estando sus ni por una tradición científica, eran criterios de moción declarando vídeo. a todos los Estados miembros su de convenio sobre la materia. de diciembre durante la sesión de 1900 de olvido Desde 1945 lo que tenemos delante. Ese proyecto, desde luego, no es una obra perfecta. El genocidio, como figura jurídica, es nueva y no hay criterios divergentes que fue necesario 
pero la gente de historia está muy fácil. Es expresar. Señor Presidente, de prevención. jurídica que me ha cabido la honra de presidir. La cobre serán sin duda las dos de esta tercera asamblea. de la humanidad hacia la mejor generación de un sentimiento un crimen que se vive que llegó durante la última guerra mundial y en los años que la precedieron. A la decisión final de la Asamblea, el proyecto de convención por medio de la cual se pone al servicio del género humano un instrumento jurídico que así tiende a prevenir como a castigar el abominable delito. La formulación de este proyecto de convención no ha sido cosa fácil. Ha sido tarea ponderosa 
en que los juristas de 58 naciones se han esforzado por encontrar las fórmulas más satisfactorias, más justas, más eficaces. Claro es que en ese empeño no ha podido lograrse la unanimidad. Las divergencias de mentalidad, de organización política, de legislación penal y de criterio científico existentes entre las diversas delegaciones han dado lugar a largos y vivos debates acerca de los conceptos que debían expresarse, los medios que debían emplearse, la técnica jurídica que debía seguirse, en una palabra, las cláusulas que debían concertarse. Esos debates solo han podido terminar por el medio razonable y democrático de acatar la voluntad de la mayoría expresada por medio del voto. Y el voto de la mayoría no solamente se ha basado en criterios de técnica jurídica, sino también en consideraciones de orden político, tendientes a eliminar puntos acerca de los cuales la opinión se encontraba hondamente dividida, y a hacer así la convención aceptables a todos los Estados. De esta manera, el proyecto finalmente aprobado representa un grande y noble esfuerzo de conciliación y constituye un común denominador de acuerdo acerca de lo que debe ser en sustancia la Convención sobre Genocidio. Las divergencias de detalle a que me he referido no pueden desvirtuar ni anular el hecho palpable de que la Convención que se encuentra ante la Asamblea responde cumplidamente a los sentimientos y a los propósitos que inspiraron la resolución de 1946. Por eso pudo verse en el Comité Jurídico que no hubo un solo voto contrario a los 30 votos afirmativos que sancionaron el proyecto. Y que lo único que puede lamentarse es que hubiera habido ocho abstenciones que posiblemente no se repetirán en esta Asamblea. Contra el proyecto de convención pueden invocarse con razones muy dignas de respeto, Peto, defectos parciales, deficiencias de técnica, desacuerdo en cuanto a conceptos de orden secundario, pero no puede alegarse vicio ni vacío fundamental. Todo lo que es básico, esencial, sustancial en materia de genocidio está consignado en los artículos del proyecto. El genocidio sea cometido en tiempo de paz o en tiempo de guerra, queda definido como un crimen de derecho internacional que las partes se comprometen a prevenir y a castigar. Se definen como genocidio los diferentes actos por medio de los cuales se puede realizar la intención de destruir total o, parcial, o parcialmente un grupo nacional, étnico, racial o religioso. Figuran en primer término, entre tales actos, la matanza de miembros del grupo, como cuando se les sujeta a mutilaciones, torturas o maltratamientos corporales. También los atentados graves contra la integridad física de los miembros del grupo, ya sea desde el punto de vista físico o desde el punto de vista de la integridad mental, como cuando se les enerva, debilita o embrutece por medio de los narcóticos. Se declaran punibles el acto mismo, el acuerdo para ejecutarlo, la incitación directa y pública a su perpetración, la tentativa y la complicidad. Se hace, se hace recaer, recaer el castigo sobre, sobre todas, todas las personas, personas naturales que lo hayan cometido, así sean gobernantes, funcionarios o particulares. Se pacta la jurisdicción criminal territorial y se deja la puerta abierta a una futura y posible jurisdicción criminal internacional. Se declara que el genocidio no será considerado como crimen político para los efectos de la extradición. Y por último, se somete 
a la Corte Internacional de Justicia todas las diferencias que surgen entre los Estados acerca de la interpretación, aplicación o ejecución del convenio, comprendiéndose entre tales diferencias las relativas a la responsabilidad, que solo puede ser la meramente internacional y de ninguna manera la civil o la criminal que no están en la mens legis del proyecto. En vista de esta enumeración, es preciso reconocer que la Convención sobre Genocidio contiene todo lo que es indispensable para condenar, prevenir y castigar el execrable crimen. Si a juicio de alguna delegación o de algún Estado hay algo que falta, algo que sobra, algo que podría mejorarse, algo que ese Estado particular no puede pactar por razones constitucionales, esas deficiencias podrán muy bien ponerse a salvo por medio de reservas. Pero en ningún caso deben dar lugar a la abstención total de firmar la Convención, sea que se acepten o no se acepten las enmiendas propuestas ante esta Asamblea. No es posible que se rechace como si fuera mala alguna cosa simplemente porque ella es susceptible de perfeccionamiento. Que les invoquen el criterio de la perfectibilidad, cabe recordarles el proverbio español de que lo mejor resulta a veces enemigo de lo bueno. Aspiremos a lo mejor, pero retengamos lo bueno mientras llega la hora del perfeccionamiento. Tenemos en nuestras manos algo que es muy grande, algo sagrado y trascendental. Rechazar ahora este noble pronunciamiento de la conciencia universal equivaldría a ponerse en contra del espíritu humano. Señores delegados, durante los últimos tres o cuatro lustros, la tierra ha sido teatro de espantosas matanzas en que han perdido la vida millones de seres humanos por el hierro, por el fuego, por el hambre, por la tortura, únicamente por el hecho de pertenecer a determinada raza, religión o nacionalidad. Las Naciones Unidas, horrorizadas, han puesto el asesinato de grupos humanos en la categoría de crimen internacional, la misma en que se hallan la piratería, la trata de blancas, el tráfico de narcóticos y otros que si son igualmente dañinos, por lo menos no son ni tan crueles en su ejecución ni de tanto alcance en sus efectos. La Convención de Genocidio, en su expresión más simple, proponen que ese crimen execrable, ese crimen que lleva la maldición de todos los espíritus altos y rectos, sea castigado por todas las naciones que han reafirmado su fe en los derechos, en la dignidad y en el valor de la persona humana. ¿Hay nación que pueda desoír ese llamamiento? ¿Hay motivo suficientemente poderoso para negar la colaboración en esta cruzada jurídica? Yo abrigo la esperanza de que no sea así. E invocando el anhelo de una humanidad angustiada y herida en lo más profundo de sus sentimientos, Hago un fervoroso llamamiento. Señor Presidente, en 1946, durante la segunda parte de la primera sesión de la Asamblea General, las delegaciones de Cuba, India y Panamá presentaron una moción declarando que el genocidio es un crimen de derecho internacional pidiendo a todos los Estados miembros su cooperación para prevenirlo y castigarlo.
au plus grand nombre possible d'États. Or, on sait que les compromis ne sont jamais tout à fait satisfaisants du point de vue de la pure logique. Et même, au point de vue pratique, ils ne sont pas toujours exempts de difficultés. C'est ainsi que la délégation belge a dû faire remarquer que les dispositions relatives à l'extradition étaient susceptibles de causer quelques difficultés et en tout cas des retards en ce qui concerne l'acceptation et l'application de la Convention pour la Belgique. L'application de ces dispositions nécessitera en effet certains remaniements législatifs et, ce qui peut être beaucoup plus difficile à réaliser, la revision de divers traités. Néanmoins, il est de la nature d'un compromis d'être accepté tel qu'il est. Et si tous les amendements et toutes les propositions rejetées doivent constamment être représentés et rediscutés au stade suivant, nous ne voyons vraiment pas comment on n'arrivera jamais à des résultats positifs. Pour ces raisons, Monsieur le Président, la délégation belge votera pour la Convention et contre tous amendements. Je vous remercie. Le Mr. President, fellow delegates, uh, following your appeal, Mr. President, which you made in your capacity as a delegate of Australia to the Economic and Social Council in Geneva on August 25th this year, and in which you urged to adopt a final convention on genocide, this third session of the General Assembly in answering your call has examined in detail the draft prepared by a subcommittee of the Economic and Social Council. In the examination, which was the task of the sixth committee, the Polish delegation has taken a very active part. In doing so, we had in mind the introductory words which you pronounced in your speech on August 25th. You said then and I take the liberty to quote you. Genocide has occurred many times over the past few thousand years. But after the Great War, many of us came to regard it as an uncivilized action which the world has grown out of. Unfortunately, we have seen some of the greatest acts of mass destruction in the history of the world perpetrated by Hitler and Nazi Germany and perpetrated upon grounds of racial or national origin. We must do all in our power to prevent these crimes from being committed again and to deter and punish the perpetrators. We in Poland have not only seen some of the greatest acts of genocide in the history of the world perpetrated by Nazi Germany. We have been directly affected by genocide. We have been the goal and the victims of such mass destructions. As a result of it, we have lost more than six million people. We have suffered material, moral, spiritual and cultural losses to an extent which is irreparable. No country, no people, no society has more interest in seeing genocide condemned and combated than Poland. Unfortunately, our expectations have not been fulfilled. The convention which has been today submitted for the, the approval of this assembly does not correspond to the most elementary, most basic demands to defeat genocide. I have to admit and admit with regret that we are thoroughly disappointed. 
already the preamble in defining the crime of genocide and in analyzing the origin of that crime avoid any reference being made to the crimes committed on a terrible and unprecedented scale and manner under and by the fascist regimes, in particular by Nazi Germany and by Franco Spain. There is a straight connection between such crimes and the propaganda of race purists of those regimes. Unfortunately, the preamble carefully omits to emphasize this obvious fact which should be the foundation stone of the Convention on Genocide. That omission, which is deliberate, and which has been done against better counsel of countries like Poland and the Soviet Union, which have suffered most at the hands of such regimes, make it impossible for the Polish delegation to accept the preamble as satisfactory. It is to us deeply disturbing that the omission was carried at the insistence of the United States delegation, which argued that retaining the organic link between the crime of genocide and the fascist race theories in the preamble would alienate Germany and Italy and would make it difficult for them to become parties to the conventions in the future. My delegation wants to make it quite clear that it is not our intention to bar either Italy or Germany from the International Convention. Quite to the contrary, we are of the opinion that the access of those countries to the Convention on Genocide is most desirable, but only if certain preconditions were fulfilled. The most important of these conditions would be the understanding of their responsibility, the recognition of their crime, and the recognition of the close link which exists between the crime of genocide and the racial theories, as well as other of their teachings, which have become their official theory and ideology during many years, and which we are afraid have still roots in those countries. This is exactly the reason why we wanted the preamble to cover such considerations. When we met with the opposition of the United States delegation against a preamble which would nail down the responsibility of fascism and Nazism for the mass aspect of the crime of genocide, we in the subcommittee attempted to find a compromise formula proposing that the following words be added. I'm quoting from the proposal of the delegation of Poland, bearing in mind that recently the crime of genocide has been committed with particular hideous results by the Nazi and fascist regimes. Our efforts, however, have been frustrated by a majority led by the United States delegation. In the opinion of the Polish delegation, it is unavoidable and necessary that the preamble, while giving a specific definition of genocide, as a crime against humanity directed towards destruction of individual human groups on racial or religious grounds must lay down the link which exists between fascism and the racial theories on one side and the crime of genocide on the other. This will be not a limitation of scope nor a introduction of irrelevant moments as the representative of the United States the states tried to prove this moment. This automatically leads towards an indication that the most decisive form of struggle against genocide lies not in nebulous formulations, but in decisive measures which prohibit the instigation of national, racial, and religious hatred and its severe punishment of persons guilty of incitement and to commitment of the crime of genocide. Genocide, gentlemen, must be fought at its root if the fight should be successful. Taking active part in the committee's work from the outset, we hope that the convention, which we shall obtain as a result of our long and arduous labor, would be drafted so as to make it really 
an effective instrument for combating this horrible crime. We had very much hope that the Convention will be a powerful instrument above all in preventing such crimes being committed again. That is why our delegation continuously stressed the preventative and prophylactic character of this Convention. We have continuously maintained that such odious a crime could properly be dealt only by taking adequate measures long before the culprit could begin to commit it. The reasons for our attitude were obvious. Having lost as a result of the Second World War six million of our people who were killed or died of torture and exhaustion, not in the consequence of direct war operations, but as victims of mass destructions committed by Nazi Germany in Poland, having borne sacrifices second to none, we were morally as well as legally entitled to ask that these horrible things should never happen again. In this connection, may I emphasize how disappointed we are with the methods and the machinery applied for the prosecution of war criminals who were responsible for the horrible crimes committed in Poland during the Hitlerite occupation. It is, in fact, a poor consolation for a nation which had suffered so much to see a few thousand criminals brought to justice. The crimes committed in Poland by the Germans cannot be repaired. But even within this limited sphere of retribution, we have been gravely disappointed. Prominent Nazis, men responsible for the extermination of tens of thousands of Poles, Czechs, Russians, Jews, Greeks, have escaped justice. Some of them are again prominent in the political life in the western zones of Germany. And even such a female monster like Ilse Koch will probably soon regain her liberty thanks to the protection of General Clay. Not even those whom we could trace and whose extradition we demanded have been delivered to us. In many cases, we are being refused the right to met out justice to them, like in the most drastic case of Dr. Dering, who exterminated thousands of people in the notorious camp of Oshinchim under the pretext of medical experiments and who now enjoys in London the protection of His Majesty's government. This is being done in spite of the unequivocal terms of the judgment of Nuremberg, of allied agreements and international obligations. Are you therefore surprised that we are suspicious about the opposition of the United States who attempt to devoid the definition and the, the definition, the close connection between fascism and the crime of genocide? Are you surprised that we suspect that behind that is an attempt in the nearest future to justify these crimes? With this in mind, we did part, take part in the discussion on genocide. Now, you can easily realize the strong desire which we have shown to see something really effective. If after a war, like the last war, we find so many cases of injustice in this field, how could we agree with the idea that half measures could be effective in the future? We have therefore, Mr. President, insisted that the Convention should first of all provide for adequate prevention of the crime of genocide. We wanted that propaganda against racial, religious and national groups should be barred because we know very well that such propaganda and such spreading of hatred leads to the crime and in turn to conflicts and wars. We have also demanded that this convention should include sanctions against preparatory acts after the experiences of the gas chambers of Oshpinchim, of Majdanek, of Belzen, of Dachau, after the horrible experiments like that of the soap factories in which human bodies were used as raw material. 
we have felt that such preparatory acts as end the armory, as it were, of the criminal should be covered by the present convention. We have submitted that this convention should bar any organization aimed at genocide. Have also sub uh, Nazi and fascist bodies should have been outlawed as far as the enemy, ex-enemy countries are concerned. Such provisions have unfortunately not been fully implemented in the convention. We have also submitted that the definition of genocide should include the odious crimes directed towards the destruction of art and culture of a nation. Crimes which, like mass extermination, are the direct consequence of racial theorist, fascist, and Nazi teachings. The delegate of the United States this morning mixed two things together. He tried to lump the problem of human rights and the problem of genocide. He, for him, the cultural genocide and the freedom to express one's opinion in whatever language it is are two the same things. Of course, it is easy for a representative of a country from behind the Atlantic Ocean who never saw war, who never saw the realities of war, to understand what cultural genocide means. It is easy to come here and under the cover of his grave concern about freedom of expression to oppose the most just demand that that crime should be covered. We Poles, however, have been repeatedly the victims of such crimes. And quite recently, our art, our science, our country suffered terrible, terrible losses at the hands of the Nazis. Professors have been tortured and not permitted to continue their scientific works. Work, universities and schools were closed. Students driven into compulsory labor camps. Clergymen stopped from performing their religious duties and sent to concentration camps. Schools, libraries, museums, churches were looted and robbed. All these horrible deeds, Mr. President, and members of this assembly were the direct consequences of the crime of genocide committed by Nazi Germany. <clears throat> we have been victims of that crime, not only in the last war. It's not the first time that in, this, in our history the cultural genocide was attempted on our nation. Our suggestions, therefore, were intended to cover these crimes explicitly by the Convention on Genocide. We regret that our suggestions in this respect and the amendments which we supported have not met with the approval of the majority, and we definitely favor the redrafting of Article 3 as suggested by the amendment of the Soviet Union. We believe that only the redrafting of it only the coverage of that crime will make the convention fully effective. You all know genocide must not be committed by physical extermination of individuals. Also cultural genocide, the deprivation of a nation of its culture, of its religion, of its language, leads in the same manner to the destruction of a nation. Another of our objections concerns Article 6, which contemplates the possibility of the jurisdiction of an international crimi criminal tribunal as far as the crime of genocide is concerned. The inclusion into the Convention on Genocide of the principle of an international criminal tribunal, a tribunal which not only does not exist, but the future creation of which is highly hypothetical and problematical, constitutes an ob obligation, at least a moral one, of the parties to this convention without their no knowing the contents of the proposal. The creation of an international criminal court, of an effective international court, must be based on compulsory jurisdiction. It cannot be based on an optional jurisdiction. In effect, 
it would have been based on the principles which are contrary to the principles on which the International Court of Justice and its status is based. Nothing was decided about the competence or the powers of such an international criminal tribunal. And in particular, whether it should supersede or only supplement the competence and jurisdiction of national tribunals. Therefore, member states, in accepting Article 6 of the Convention in its present form, would be obliged to sign a blank acceptance, being quite ignorant of the obligations they assume. An international criminal jurisdiction is only possible in practice when an international executive power exists, which has at its disposal substantial means of enforcement. Therefore, the introduction of the principle of an international criminal court into Article 6 of the present Convention on Genocide can easily constitute an intervention into the internal affairs of state and a violation of their sovereignty. And we have plenty of doubt whether it is not aimed for that purpose. We cannot submit in advance to, to the International Criminal Court, which does not exist and which has not been formally proposed or even discussed and which may never even come into being. The representative of the Netherlands said that that will secure justice. But I'm, uh, it is, I regret to have to state here that we saw another international tribunal not securing justice at all. Should I enumerate here the long list of Nazis, like Hjalmar Marshak, like General Holder, who have been recently released by the International Tribunal, who sat under the chairmanship of American judges? Furthermore, Mr. President, we take exception at the rejection of the article which provided that command of law and superior orders shall not justify genocide. We cannot share any responsibility for a genocide convention which does not contain this provision. We shall may continue to fight that this provision be included. It is necessary to remember that the Nuremberg Charter and the military statuses of several states contain already this provision. Therefore, the rejection constitutes a serious step back in the evolution of international law. The omission of this provision practically prevents the application of Article 5 of the Committee's Draft Convention, stating that heads of state, public officials, and private individuals shall be punished for genocide as heads of state may always invoke their country's law, while public officials and private individuals may always invoke superior's order and thus plead not guilty, the convention will have no practical effect at all, and the punishment will be directed against a certain amount of smaller individuals, leaving unpunished the main instigators of the crime. May I, with your permission, Mr. President, point out here what I pointed already out at the Economic and Social Council. The verdict issued on 10th of July 1948 by the Supreme National Tribunal of Poland sentencing to death Joseph Bira, the first deputy of the notorious Hans Franz, the Nazi Governor General of Poland, accused of applying the principles of German expansion and superiority of their race and thus causing the death of many thousands and thousands of citizens of Poland. Dealer pleaded not guilty, claiming that his actions were on superior orders. The tribunal, however, following the line of reasoning of the state prosecutor, found, you allow me to quote the state prosecutor, the murderer from behind the desk, the murderer by pen, guilty and sentenced him to capital punishment. The delegation of Poland must protest here in the strongest possible terms against the omission of the provisions concerning command of law and the responsibility when acting under superior orders. Mr. President, the effect of the convention will depend upon such formulations which could provide the greatest amount of accessions, signatures, and ratifications. The effect of the Convention will depend 
whether it will cover all the territories without distinction as to their juridical status. Isn't it so, gentlemen, that we are mainly concerned about weak nations, about small nations who are mostly in danger that the crime of genocide be committed. Therefore, trust territories, dependent territories, colonies should be first of all covered by the convention. I am deeply moved by the great concern which has been shown by the representative of the United Kingdom about the jurisdiction, the local jurisdiction and the local parliaments of the dependent territories. I wonder whether in any other cases it is shown. We, Mr. President, consider that if the convention be effective, it must apply to colonies and metropolitan states, whether they like or they don't, must apply it and be punished for a crime of genocide, which has been many times committed in colonies and is always in the colonies and colonial peoples are always in danger that the metropolitan, metropolitan states will commit that crime either in the direct physical form or as a cultural genocide. Having stated, Mr. President, the objections of my delegation, I would like to make it clear that in general, the Polish delegation considers the draft convention on genocide, although incomplete, and with plenty of room for improvement as representing a great step forward. We are interested in the laying down of bars in the future against crimes of genocide. Victory over Nazism and fascism will not be complete if we do not establish provisions eliminating once and forever that horrible crime of genocide. We regret that the draft of the legal committee is not satisfactory. And we appeal from this rostrum and we believe we have the greatest right to appeal. We appeal to this, to this assembly to adopt the convention in such terms which would promote general acceptance and avoid everything which can be considered as an attempt to make the general application of the convention on genocide impossible. The Soviet delegation has submitted several amendments. Most of these amendments cover the points which we have raised and cover our objections. For these reasons, we support the amendments, we shall vote for them, and we appeal to all of you here to vote for them, to include them into the convention, and make the convention into an effective weapon. Only an effective convention can prevent in the future the crime of genocide being ever committed. The delegate of Czechoslovakia. Mesdames et Messieurs, si je prends la parole devant cette honorable Assemblée, ce n'est que dans le but de souligner quelle importance mon pays attribue au projet de convention devant être voté ici peu. Dès commencement, nous avons dit que nous voulions voir une convention réellement efficace et basé sur les expériences historiques terribles par lesquelles ont passé tous ceux qui ont été asservis par une occupation nazie, fasciste ou japonaise dans n'importe quelle partie du monde. Nous croyons qu'il a été suffisamment prouvé que les crimes tels qu'on a commis au nom de la doctrine de Helmholtz reste supérieure ont toute la même source, la source si heureusement exprimée dans le premier amendement 
présenté par la délégation de l'Union soviétique. Et je crois que nous avons le devoir envers toutes les victimes de ces horreurs de mettre en tête de notre document les noms des doctrines qui ont conduit à ces monstruosités et de le dire clairement, sans aucun équivoque. Hitler et Mussolini et ceux qui les ont aidés méritent pleinement qu'on leur construise un monument sur lequel leur nom serait gravé. Ce monument devrait être la convention sur le génocide et l'inscription devrait être son préambule. Je ne crois pas que l'adoption de l'amendement soviétique limiterait la portée de la convention, mais à mon avis, elle lui donnerait un sens beaucoup plus précis. Et s'il ne s'agissait que de moi, je proposerais même qu'on y ajoute comme annexe Mein Kampf, le livre de Mussolini sur le fascisme et le procès verbal de Nürnberg, pour que chacun puisse voir la semence et les fruits, la cause et les effets, pour qu'il ne soit plus jamais de doute quelles forces sont à l'origine des génocides et qu'est-ce que nous entendons de punir et d'exterminer. Pour les mêmes raisons, nous sommes d'avis que les parties contractantes devraient prendre l'engagement solennel à dissoudre les organisations ayant pour but d'attiser les haines raciales, nationales et religieuses. Nous avons déjà incorporé ce principe dans notre Constitution et nous ne voyons aucune raison valide qu'on tolère ces activités et qu'on permette qu'elles se propagent et infectent les peuples. Si l'on hésite de prendre les dispositions à ce sujet à temps, ceci équivaut à un encouragement des crimes futurs qu'il serait tard à poursuivre si entre temps des millions de hommes innocents payeraient de leur vie pour le fait que nous avons refusé de lever ici nos mains pour voter en faveur d'un article en plus de la Convention. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai écouté l'appel ardent à l'unanimité fait par l'honorable représentant de l'Australie et par d'autres délégués. Depuis 1933, et même avant ça, nous avons adressé nous-mêmes aussi des appels urgents au monde entier quand nous avons vu les dangers nazis se propager en Allemagne. Mais on nous disait, ceci ce n'est rien, Hitler est pacifique. Ces SA et SS ne sont que des jeux innocents. Vous savez que les Allemands aiment les uniformes et les parades avec la musique militaire. Hitler n'avait que des maîtres de l'ordre en Allemagne, comme a fait Mussolini en Italie. Vous n'avez rien à craindre, on vous aidera si nécessaire, etc. Et le résultat en a été qu'on nous a amenés à l'abattoir de Munich où l'on nous a présenté sans aucune discussion à la signature un document et puis on nous a mis à la porte en nous sans les épaules. Je crains que si nous ne dirons pas précisément dans le préambule même contre quel danger nous voulons lutter, il y aura un jour de nouveau des politiciens et des soi-dit juristes qui diraient que la Convention ne s'applique pas à des cas pareils et qu'il n'y a aucune raison d'avoir des soucis. En disant ceci, je ne parle pas à ce moment pour mon pays, puisque nous avons trouvé les alliances solides, fidèles, que nous considérons vitales pour tout notre avenir. Mais je parle pour les autres, auxquels nous ne souhaitons pas un destin tel qu'il fut le nôtre. Monsieur le délégué des États-Unis a exprimé ici, ce matin, un certain regret et, je crois, un certain reproche à l'adresse de l'Union soviétique d'avoir porté devant cette Assemblée ces amendements. Eh bien, quand il s'agissait hier d'éliminer de la résolution sur le gaspillage des denrées alimentaires, la mention 
ont recommandé au pays de rendre possible aux paysans de se procurer à bon marché l'essentiel dont ils ont besoin pour leur production, on a proposé à l'Assemblée des amendements. On n'a ménagé aucun effort. Mais quand il s'agit de questions telles que de mettre les nazis au pilori, on hésite et on veut reprocher à l'Union soviétique d'avoir présenté son amendement. Si nous disons que nous voulions une convention efficace, ceci inclut aussi la question des tribunaux. Et nous ne pouvons pas être d'accord avec, avec les affirmations faites ici que ce n'est qu'un tribunal international qui pourrait rendre justice dans les cas pareils. Certainement, si les pays permettent l'existence des organisations criminelles et leur propagande, les tribunaux des pays respectifs pourraient à un moment donné être eux-mêmes impuissants, indulgents et inclinés d'acquitter tous les criminels comme nous en avons vu en Italie et en Allemagne à son temps. Mais si la situation est déjà telle, qui est-ce qui pourrait croire qu'un pays qui devient lui-même criminel accepterait ce fameux tribunal international C'est pour cette raison que nous sommes convaincus qu'il faut lutter dès le commencement et dans ce cas, on n'a pas besoin d'un tribunal international qui, au contraire, pourrait devenir le refuge de tous ceux qui craindraient la justice de leur propre pays. En terminant, je voudrais donc accentuer de nouveau qu'à notre avis, la Convention devant nous ne deviendra pas réellement efficace que si les amendements présentés par l'Union soviétique soient acceptés. Merci. Delegate of Uruguay. Señor Presidente, la delegación del Uruguay señaló en sus declaraciones liminales, liminares en la sexta comisión que por razones técnicas y prácticas que expuse entonces, estimaba conveniente la eliminación en esta convención de las referencias relativas a los grupos políticos y al llamado genocidio cultural. También señaló que estimaba imprescindible el establecimiento, siquiera en principio, de una jurisdicción internacional para castigar el genocidio, sin lo cual habríamos escrito sobre el agua. La Comisión aceptó la supresión de los puntos relativos a los grupos políticos, así como al llamado genocidio cultural, y además, en lo esencial, tuvo el acierto de restablecer en el artículo séptimo, aunque solo en principio, la jurisdicción internacional para castigar los delitos previstos en la Convención. Esperamos que la afortunada resolución B, que se refiere al estudio de la cuestión del Tribunal Penal Internacional por la Comisión de Derecho Internacional, permitirá lograr soluciones efectivas de progreso en un futuro próximo. Por lo tanto, con esta esperanza, la delegación del Uruguay votará afirmativamente el proyecto de la sexta comisión convencida de que esta convención, aunque no es perfecta, significa un progreso real en la evolución del derecho internacional hacia el futuro de una humanidad mejor organizada. Finalmente, con mucho sentimiento, expresamos que a esta altura de nuestros trabajos no considero oportuno entrar a tratar las enmiendas que han sido presentadas a la Asamblea por Venezuela y por la Unión Soviética, y que por lo tanto votaremos en contra de ellas. Muchas gracias. El delegado de China.
Monsieur le Président, la Chine, dès le commencement, a toujours été partisan de la nécessité de réprimer la génocide comme crime international. La délégation chinoise a participé activement à la commission spéciale de génocide pour préparer le projet de la Convention internationale sur la génocide. Elle désire sincèrement que la Convention soit rapidement élaborée pour punir ce crime effroyable, ce qui constituerait un grand progrès humain ainsi qu'un pas en avant indispensable pour la paix universelle. La sixième commission est arrivée après de longues et laborieuses discussions à établir le projet de convention de génocide soumis en ce moment à l'examen et au vote de l'Assemblée. La délégation chinoise regrette cependant qu'il y a quelques lacunes dans le projet de convention, que je vais énumérer quelques-uns très rapidement. Premièrement, les génocides culturels ont été écartés. Pourtant, ce genre de crime de génocide est peut-être pire que le génocide physique et biologique. En effet, le génocide culturel est moins apparent, moins brutal, n'impressionne pas autant les masses, mais il est plus étendu, plus profond, en ce sens qu'il s'infiltre et s'étend comme une tâche d'huile. Le génocide culturel, tant à priver par tous les moyens, actes et mesures, un peuple entier de sa culture ancestrale, allant jusqu'à lui faire oublier ce qui est ses origines, son histoire, sa religion et même sa propre langue. Deuxièmement, la suppression des mots « groupe politique » dans l'article 2 affaiblit notamment cette convention. En effet, le génocide contre les groupes politiques est le crime qui choque le plus la démocratie moderne. En supprimant les mots « groupe politique », on donne l'impression de vouloir tolérer les crimes contre les ennemis politiques, ce qui est sûrement contraire à l'esprit de la convention. La délégation chinoise, tout en constatant ces lacunes dans le projet de la Convention, voterait en faveur pour l'adoption de cette Convention, considérant qu'elle marque tout de même un progrès énorme dans le droit pénal international. La délégation chinoise, en vue de ce que j'ai dit plus haut sur le génocide culturel, voterait pour le deuxième amendement soviétique. Et au cas où cet amendement ne serait pas accepté par l'Assemblée, elle voterait pour l'amendement vénézuélien. Quant aux autres amendements soviétiques, la délégation chinoise serait obligée de voter contre ou de s'abstenir. Enfin, la délégation chinoise, tout en votant pour la Convention, entend réserver pour son gouvernement le droit de signer et de ratifier avec certaines réserves la Convention de génocide, après un examen plus approfondi par les services compétents du texte de cette Convention. Merci, M. Discussion is now closed and we should come to the vote. There are, uh, if you will look at document A766. Having in hand the uh, committee's report number A760, <coughs> looking at A766, you'll find the six proposed amendments of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I shall put those in order. Then I shall put the amendment submitted by the delegation of Venezuela contained in document A770. The first amendment uh, of the Union of Soviet... Yes, come on. Presidente, como lo manifesté en mi intervención de esta mañana, mi delegación presentó su enmienda 
como una última apelación a la Asamblea para tomar la decisión que nosotros considerábamos que completaría la Convención sobre el Genocidio. En vista de que la Asamblea no se haya dispuesta, como lo hemos comprobado ya por las manifestaciones de algunos delegados, a favorecer lo que nosotros solicitábamos, y con el fin de no dificultar el trabajo urgente de estos últimos momentos, la delegación de Venezuela retira su enmienda en la esperanza de que más adelante, en una posible revisión de la convención, los Estados partes convengan a la luz de la experiencia en proteger los elementos cuyo amparo solicitaba nuestra enmienda. As this amendment was not uh, approved by the committee, nor included in its report, the delegate of Venezuela is entitled to withdraw the amendment. And therefore, I shall not put A77. Now, I'll come to the first uh, amendment put forward by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And the uh, first amendment uh, proposes, in addition to the preamble, uh, after the words had inflicted great losses on humanity. Uh, and I shall read, if I may, at page nine of the main report and the relevant passage in the present approved text that is approved by the committee is as follows. The contracting parties, having considered the declaration made by the General Assembly of the United Nations in its resolution 96-1, dated the 11th of December 1946, the genocide is a crime under international law, contrary to the spirit and aims of the United Nations and condemned by the civilized world, recognizing that at all periods of history, genocide has inflicted great losses on humanity. And then these words are proposed to be added by the first amendment of the USSR, these words. And recent events have shown that the crime of genocide is organically bound up with fascism, Nazism, and other similar race theories, which propagate racial and national hatred, the domination of the so-called higher races, and the extermination of the so-called lower races. All those in favor of the amendment, providing for the addition of the words I've read, first amendment of the USSR, will please raise the hand. Again, Will you raise the hand again and keep it raised, please? All those against? Abstentions? The voting is in favor of the amendment seven, against the amendment 34, abstentions 10, the amendment is lost. The next amendment, number two of document A7666, also an amendment of the USSR, proposes to add a new article called Article 3 to the draft convention. Uh, convention. And if you look at Article 2 of the, uh, res of the draft convention at page 9 of the main report, you'll see a definition of uh, genocide in the present convention 
Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And then the various acts in relation to the group were set out, namely A, B, C, D and E. And at that point in the text, the amendment proposes to add a new article as follows. In this convention, genocide also means any deliberate act committed with the intent to destroy the language, religion or culture of a national, racial or religious group on grounds of national or racial origin or religious beliefs, beliefs such as A, prohibiting the use of the language of the group in daily intercourse or in schools or the printing and circulation of publications in the language of the group. B, destroying or preventing the use of libraries, museums, schools, historical monuments, places of worship or other cultural institutions and objects of the group. All those who are in favour of that amendment having the effect of adding a new article to the convention will please raise the hand. Roll call? Yeah, roll call vote is requested. A roll call vote is requested. Those in favour of the addition of this article, which I've read, number two of the USSR amendment, will say yes. Those who are against will say no. Those who abstain will say abstain. First country to be called on to vote is Turkey. 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 No. Ukraine, yes. South Africa, abstain. Soviet Union, yes. United Kingdom, no. The United States, no. Paraguay, no. Venezuela, abstention. Yemen, abstention. Yugoslavia, yes. Afghanistan, abstain. Argentina, no. Australia, no. Belgium, no. Bolivia, no. Brazil, no. Burma, abstain. Belarus, yes. Canada, no. Chile, no. China, yes. Colombia, no. Costa Rica, absent. Cuba, no. Czechoslovakia, yes. Denmark, no. Dominican Republic, no. Ecuador, absent. Egypt, abstention. El Salvador, absent. Ethiopia, abstain. France, no. Greece, no. Guatemala, abstain. Haiti, yes. Honduras, no. Iceland, no. India, no. Iran, no. Iraq, abstain. Lebanon, yes. Liberia, yes. Luxembourg, no. Mexico, abstain. Netherlands, no. New Zealand, no. Nicaragua, no. Norway, no. Pakistan, yes. Panama, no. Paraguay, no. Peru, no. Philippines, yes. Poland, yes. Saudi Arabia, yes. Siam, no. Sweden, no. Syria, yes.
The voting on the amendment number two is yes, 14, no, 31, abstentions, 10. The amendment is lost. The third amendment proposed by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, number three, still document A76, is to delete from Article 6 the words, or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction with respect to those contracting parties which shall have accepted its jurisdiction. Turning to Article 6, it reads at present, persons charged with genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed. And then these are the words that are proposed to be omitted. Or that is tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed, or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction with respect to those contracting parties which will have accepted its jurisdiction. And the object of the amendment is to omit the words I've just read, the effect of which will be to limit the, the uh, a tribunal to a competent tribunal of the state and the territory of which the act was committed. All those in favour of the roll call vote is out. All those in favour of the amendment number three will say yes. All those against it will say no. All those abstaining will say abstain. First country to vote in accordance with the rule for ballot. <coughs> Ethiopia? Absent. Absent? No. no. Ethiopia. Ethiopia? No. France? No. <clears throat> Greece? No. Guatemala? No. Haiti? No. Honduras? No. Iceland? No. India? Yes. Iran? No. Iraq, abstention, Lebanon, no, Liberia, no, Luxembourg, no, Mexico, abstain, Netherlands, no, New Zealand, no, Nicaragua, no, Norway, no, Pakistan, no, Panama, no, Paraguay, no, Peru, Abstain, Philippines, no, Poland, yes, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia, no, Siam, no, Sweden, no, Syria, no, <clears throat> Turkey, abstain, Ukraine, <clears throat> yes, South Africa, abstain, Soviet Union, yes, United Kingdom, no. United States? No. <coughs> Paraguay? No. Venezuela? Abstain. Yemen? No. Yugoslavia? Yes. Afghanistan? Abstain. Argentina? Abstain. Australia? No. And Belgium? Belgium? No. <coughs> Bolivia? No. Brazil? No. Burma? No. Belarusia? Yes. Canada? No. Chile? No. China? No. Colombia? No. Costa Rica? Absent. Cuba? No. Uh, Czechoslovakia? Yes. Denmark? No. Dominican Republic? Yes. Ecuador, absent, A <coughs> Egypt, <coughs> Egypt, no, <coughs> El Salvador, absent.
The voting on the amendment is in favour of it, <coughs> eight, against 39, abstentions eight. The amendment is lost. We, we now turn to amendment number four, still in document A766, and that amendment proposes to add a new article to the convention as follows. The high contracting parties undertake to disband and to prohibit in future the existence of organisations aimed at the incitement of racial, national and religious hatred and at provoking the commission of crimes of genocide. Is a roll call vote desired? Yes, roll call vote on that new article. Those in favour of the addition of the new article to the convention will say yes. Those against, no. Those who abstain will say abstain. First <coughs> country to vote on the amendment is Mexico. Mexico. Abstention. Netherlands. No. New Zealand. No. Nicaragua. No. Norway. No. Pakistan. Yes. Panama. Panama. No. Paraguay. No. Peru. Abstain. Philippines. Abstain. Poland. Yes. Saudi Arabia. Yes. Siam. No. Sweden. No. Syria. Abstain, Turkey, no, Ukraine, yes, South Africa, abstain, Soviet Union, yes, United Kingdom, no, the United States, no, Uruguay, no, Venezuela, no, Yemen, abstain, Yugoslavia, yes, Afghanistan, Abstain. Argentina. No. Australia. No. Belgium. No. Bolivia. No. Brazil. Brazil. No. Burma. Yes. Belarus. Yes. Canada. No. Chile. No. China. China. No. Colombia. No. Costa Rica. Absolutely. Cuba. No. Czechoslovakia. Yes. Denmark. No. Dominican Republic. No. Ecuador. Absent. Egypt. No. El Salvador. Absent. Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Abstain, France. Abstain, Greece. No. Guatemala. Abstain, Haiti. Abstain, Honduras. Abstain. Abstain. Iceland. No. India. India, no. Iran, no. Iraq, abstain. Lebanon, abstain. Liberia, yes. Luxembourg, no. The voting is 
In favor of the amendment 10, against 31, abstentions 4, the amendment is lost. Now, please turn to amendment number 5, still document A766, the Soviet uh, Union amendments. And the amendment is to amend Article 12 to read as follows. The application of the present convention shall extend equally to the territory of any contracting party and to all territories in regard to which such a state performs the functions of the governing and administering authority, including trust and other non-self-governing territories. And that is the uh, way in which Article 12 uh, will read if the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Article 12 at present in the text is at page 11 of the main report. It reads as follows. Any contracting party may at any time, by notification addressed to the Secretary General of the United Nations, extend the application of the present convention to all or any of the territories for the conduct of whose foreign relations that contracting party is responsible. It's proposed to replace that provision by a new article which would read that the application of the present convention shall extend equally to the territory of any contracting party and to all territories in regard to which such a state performs the functions of the governing and administering authority, including trust and other non-self-governing territories. So it doesn't depend upon notification or extension of application, but operates by its own force. That is the purpose of the amendment. I have a roll call vote. All those in favour of the amendment number five will say yes. All those against, no. All those abstaining will say abstain. The first member to vote on this occasion is Netherlands. Netherlands? No. no. New Zealand? Abstain? Nicaragua? No. Norway? No. Pakistan? Yes. Panama? No. Paraguay? No. Peru? Abstain? Philippines? Yes. Yes. Poland? Yes. Saudi Arabia? Yes. Siam? No. Sweden? No. Syria? Yes. Turkey? No. Ukraine? Yes. South Africa? No. Soviet Union? Yes. United Kingdom? No. United States? No. Uruguay? Abstain? Venezuela? Yes. Yemen? Yes. Yugoslavia? Yes. Afghanistan, abstain. Argentina, abstain. Australia, no. Belgium, no. Bolivia, no. Brazil, no. Burma, yes. Belarusia, yes. Canada, no. Chile, abstain. China, abstain. Colombia, no. Costa Rica, absent. Cuba, abstain. Czechoslovakia, yes. Denmark, no. American Republic, no. Ecuador, absent. Uh, Ecuador, Ecuador, abstention. Egypt, abstention. El Salvador, absent. Ethiopia, Abstention. Uh, France, no. Greece, no. Guatemala, yes. Haiti, yes. Honduras, abstain. Iceland, no. India, abstain. Iran, abstain. Iraq, yes. Lebanon, yes. Liberia, yes. Luxembourg, no. Mexico, yes.
The voting on the Fifth Amendment is as follows. In favour of the amendment, 19. Against, 23. Abstentions, 14. Proposed amendment is defeated. The Sixth Amendment, uh, the Sixth Amendment falls because it's merely consequential upon the upon the inclusion of two new articles which have already been rejected by your prior vote. And so, gentlemen, we come to the we come to the the amendments have been put. The text remains. And before I put the resolution A relating to the adoption of the convention in on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide together with the text of the convention i've been asked by the delegate of the ussr for permission to make a short statement in relation to the vote and i now call upon the delegate of the ussr Господин председатель, делегация Союза Советских Социалистических Республик считает необходимым сделать следующее заявление о позиции, которую она займет при предстоящем голосовании Конвенции о предупреждении и наказании преступлений геноцида. Делегация Советского Союза рассматривает преступления геноцида, направленные на истребление отдельных групп населения по расовым, национальным, религиозным мотивам, как один из тягчайших видов преступлений против человечества. Факты, приведенные уже в выступлении представителя Советского Союза при обосновании внесенных на рассмотрение Ассамблеи поправок и дополнений к проекту Конвенции, <coughs> свидетельствуют о том, что преступления геноцида органически связаны с фашизмом, нацизмом и расистскими теориями, пропагандирующими расовую и национальную ненависть, господство так называемых высших рас и истребление так называемых низших рас. Этот вид преступлений ложится позорным пятном на страны, где еще имеет место совершение таких преступлений, попытки или подстрекательства их совершений. Такие действия являются грубым нарушением принципов и целей Организации Объединенных Наций. Борьба с геноцидом требует от всех Объединенных Наций решительных мер, направленных на предупреждение и пресечение указанных преступлений, а также на недопущение расовой, национальной, религиозной вражды и строгого наказания виновных подстрекательств, совершений или подготовки к совершению таких преступлений. Вы уже указывали, что Советский Союз более, чем какое-либо другое государство, имеет право указать на необходимость организации эффективной борьбы со всяческими попытками возрождения фашистской практики, породившей такие преступления, как геноцид. Поэтому делегации Советского Союза, как в специальном комитете по геноциду, подготовившем первоначальный проект конвенции, так и на текущей сессии Генеральной Ассамблеи, прилагало все усилия для того, чтобы добиться выработки такой конвенции, которая могла бы действительно обеспечить борьбу с этим тягчайшим преступлением. Делегация Союза СССР должна констатировать, что ее предложения, направленные к устранению ряда существенных дефектов проекта конвенции, не получили одобрения большинства. Поэтому в проекте по-прежнему продолжает оставаться целый ряд существенных недостатков. В результате отклонения советской поправки к преамбуле, в которой предлагалось указать, что преступления геноцида органически связаны с фашизмом, нацизмом и разного рода российскими теориями, Экс конвенции не дает достаточного представления о действительных виновниках такого изуверского преступления, каким является геноцид. Делегация СССР считает необходимым еще раз обратить внимание Генеральной Ассамблеи на недопустимость всяких попыток уклониться от ясного и последовательного осуждения указанных каннибальских теорий фашизма и преступлений фашистских властей. Отклонение предложения делегации СССР включить в конвенцию статью, обязывающую всех ее участников распустить 
и впредь не допускать существования организаций, цель которых направлена на разжигание расовой, национальной, религиозной вражды и на совершение преступлений геноцида, безусловно подрывает эффективность конвенции как орудие борьбы против геноцида. Ценность конвенции также принижается вследствие отклонения предложения внесенного делегацией Советского Союза включить в конвенцию статью о так называемом национально-культурном геноциде и предусмотреть наказуемость действий, совершаемых с намерением уничтожить язык, религию или культуру какой-либо национальной, расовой или религиозной группы и, в частности, такие действия, как запрещение какой-либо национальной, расовой, религиозной группе пользоваться национальным языком в повседневной жизни или в школах, запрещение печатания и распространения изданий на языке такой группы, уничтожение библиотек, музеев, школ, исторических памятников, зданий, предназначенных для нужд религиозных культов или других культурных зданий и предметов культуры такой группы, а также недопущение пользоваться таковыми. Мы уже отмечали, что отсутствие такой статьи в Конвенции может быть использовано теми, кто попирает элементарные права национальных и расовых меньшинств и осуществляя угнетение и дискриминацию в отношении этих меньшинств и национальных групп, проводит преступную практику геноцида. Между тем, даже в почтенных странах, которые течатся своей цивилизацией, не говоря уже о колониях, гнеты преследования в отношении национальных меньшинств и национальной групп является общеизвестным фактом и носит вопиющий характер. Оставление в Конвенции статьи 12, предоставляющей колониальным державам право распространять или не распространять действия Конвенции на местом управляющейся территории и отклонение предложения делегации Советского Союза о том, что все положения Конвенции о борьбе с геноцидом должны распространяться также на несамоуправляющейся территории, включая подопечные, как мы уже отмечали, уменьшает значение Конвенции, снижает ее ценность для многих и многих сотен миллионов населения колониальных и зависимых стран. Советский Союз является последовательным противником колониальных систем и считает большим недостатком Конвенции принятую по предложению британской делегации статью 12, развязывающую и в этом случае руки колониальным державам. Такое решение противоречит высоким принципам и целям Организации Объединенных Наций, в частности, провозглашенным в главе 11 Устава Организации Объединенных Наций. Вышеперечисленные основные дефекты представленного на рассмотрение Ассамблеи проекта Конвенции безусловно снижают его эффективность. Поскольку, однако, Конвенция содержит осуждение геноцида и призывает все государства к борьбе с этим преступлением, которое до настоящего времени во многих случаях оставалось безнаказанным, советская делегация будет голосовать за одобрение этой Конвенции. При этом... При этом делегация Советского Союза считает необходимым заявить, что в отношении предусматриваемой статьей 9 подсудности Международному суду споров по толкованию, применению или выполнению конвенции Советский Союз будет придерживаться, как это он делал и до сего времени, такой позиции, согласно которой для передачи того или иного спора на разрешение Международного суда необходимо в каждом отдельном случае согласие всех спорящих или заинтересованных сторон. Поскольку наши предложения, относящиеся к статье 12 проекта Конвенции, отклонены, делегация Советского Союза будет также голосовать за принятие резолюции, рекомендующей участникам Конвенции, которые управляют зависящими от них территориями, предпринять необходимые и возможные меры для того, чтобы положение Конвенции могли быть распространены в кратчайший срок на эти территории. Вместе с этим делегация СССР вновь указывает на то, что эта рекомендация совершенно недостаточна для разрешения вопроса о безусловном распространении действия конвенции на зависимые территории, так как представляет собой лишь просьбу, обращенную колониальным державам.
Now, I shall now put the mine resolution number A of recommended by the committee. The General Assembly approves the annexed convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide and proposes it for signature and ratification or accession in accordance with its Article 11. I won't read the whole of the document. The roll call vote on this. In the first country, those in favour of the resolution approving of the convention in this way will say yes. Those against will say no. Those abstaining will say abstain. First country to vote on the roll call vote is India. India, yes. <clears throat> Iran, yes. <clears throat> Iraq, yes. Lebanon, yes. Liberia, yes. Luxembourg, yes. Mexico, yes. Netherlands, yes. New Zealand, yes. Nicaragua, yes. Norway, yes. Pakistan, yes. Panama, Yes, Paraguay, yes, Peru, yes, Philippines, yes, Poland, yeah. Poland, yes, Saudi Arabia, yes, Siam, yes, Sweden, yes, Syria, yes, Turkey, yes, Ukraine, yes, South Africa, South Africa, absent. Soviet Union, yes. United Kingdom, yes. United States, yes. Uruguay, yes. Venezuela, yes. Yemen, yes. Yugoslavia, yes. <clears throat> Afghanistan, yes. Argentina, yes. Australia, Australia, yes. Belgium, yes. Bolivia, yes. Brazil, yes. Burma, yes. Belarusia, yes. Canada, yes. Chile, yes. China, yes. Colombia, yes. Costa Rica, absent. Cuba, yes. Czechoslovakia, yes. Denmark, yes. Dominican Republic, yes. Ecuador, yes. Egypt, Yes. El Salvador, absent. Ethiopia, yes. France, yes. Greece, yes. Guatemala, yes. Haiti, yes. Honduras, yes. Iceland, yes. The voting for the adoption of the convention is as follows. Yes, 55. There are no votes against the convention. There are three absentees. So the convention is adopted by this assembly by unanimous vote. Resolution B, I shall now put to the vote. The General Assembly, considering that the discussion of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide has raised the question of the desirability and possibility of having persons charged with genocide tried by a competent international tribunal, considering that in the course of development of the international community, there will be an increasing need of an international judicial organ trial of certain crimes under international law, invites the International Law Commission to study the, the desirability and possibility of establishing an international judicial organ for the trial of persons charged with genocide or other crimes over which jurisdiction <coughs> will be conferred upon that organ by international conventions. Request the International Law Commission in carrying out this task to pay attention to the possibility of establishing a criminal chamber of the International Court of Justice. All those in favour of the adoption of that resolution recommended by the committee will please raise the hand.
We can't see the hands going up. I wish the officers would keep them off. One, two. One, two. Three. Three. The voting on the resolution B is in favour. In, in favour, 43. Against, 6. Abstentions, 3. And we come to the third resolution, C. Resolution relating to the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of, crime of Genocide with respect to dependent territories. The General Assembly recommends that parties to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide which administer dependent territories should take such measures as are necessary and feasible to enable the provisions of the Convention to be extended to those territories as soon as possible. All those in favour of the adoption of that resolution will please raise the hand. All those against? Abstentions? No abstention. Yes, one abstention. Abstention? Yes. Right. The voting is 50 in favour. Against none. Abstention one, I declare resolution C adopted. Those are the three resolutions recommended by the committee, and they've all been adopted by these overwhelming votes. <coughs> I'd like to say this as President, that the approval of this convention on genocide by the assembly is an epoch-making event. The wholesale or partial destruction. destruction of religious, racial and national groups has long shocked the conscience of mankind. In past centuries, endeavours were occasionally made to preserve... Yes, for the adoption of the convention is as follows. Yes. 55. There are no votes against the convention. There are three absentees. So the convention is adopted by this assembly by unanimous vote. <laughs> Our approval of this convention marks an important advance in the development of international criminal law. Formerly, basic human rights have been protected by international conventions enacting penal sanctions against things like piracy, the slave trade, traffic in women and children. Now we are protecting the most fundamental right of all, the very right of human groups to exist as groups. And in so doing, the General Assembly is taking positive action to fulfill its mission under Article 13 of the Charter, that is to promote the progressive development of international law and its codification. Finally, let me remind you that the basic resolution of the Assembly on Genocide in 1946 was also one of the few resolutions which were unanimously accepted at the first session of the Assembly. That resolution stated that the crime of genocide shocked the conscience of mankind inflicted great losses on humanity, was contrary to the aims and principles of the United Nations. At that time, all nations felt that political <coughs> or legalistic reservations should yield to moral principles and considerations of human solidarity, which demanded the preservation of religious, racial, and national groups. This spirit must prevail among us also today and tomorrow. I would urge and I think that's the spirit, the unanimous view of the Assembly, that this convention be signed by all states, 
ratified by all parliaments at the earliest date in order that basic human rights be given the protection of international law for the sake of progress, social and international peace.